Hi, today I'm going to talk about the relationship between eating salt and high blood pressure and why it's not necessarily what you think it's true. And it's coming right up. Most of us think that if you develop high blood pressure or hypertension, that you should eat a low salt diet. And this has been the teaching for the last 30, 40 years to virtually everybody, to the general public, to physicians, to dietitians, to everybody. However, it's interesting that the science is not really all that well defined. And several years ago, the Institute of Medicine in the United States, which is responsible for looking at the sum total of these evidence, supporting a low salt diet actually concluded something quite to the contrary. When they looked at all the scientific evidence that was available, the first conclusion they made was that the lack of evidence of benefit and concern for harm suggests that low sodium intake should not be recommended. That's really interesting because what they're saying is that you should not eat a low salt diet, you should eat more salt. For example, in this uh, article in the British Medical Journal, they took 34 different trials that had been published and they included it in their analysis. And what they saw was that on average, when you eat a low salt diet, you can reduce the blood pressure by 5.4 millimeters of mercury. On the top and on the bottom, the diastolic, it goes down by 2.4. And that was their conclusion. They said that there was a significant and important fall in the blood pressure in normal and people with high blood pressure. Well, that sounds pretty good, right? It's not quite that simple because one of the things you have to do when doing these meta-analyses is to look for evidence of publication bias. So a small trial that shows that eating less salt uh, causes lower blood pressure might get published, whereas a small trial that shows the opposite, that eating a low salt diet does not cause any difference in blood pressure, may not be published. So if you only po uh, publish the positive results and you don't publish the negative results, you're going to get a skewed view of things. It's sort of like flipping a coin and every time it comes up head, you say that counts and when it comes up negative, you say that doesn't count. Well, pretty soon you're going to conclude that the coin always comes up heads when in fact it's about 50-50. In order to get around this, we do something called a funnel plot analysis. And this is what a normal funnel plot analysis should look like. The, the, the central line is what our best guess of the effect is. Along the uh, x-axis, along the bottom, what you can see is that these trials are getting larger and larger. And as you get larger, you have fewer trials because they're more expensive to do. The smaller trials are smaller. When you look at the funnel plot, you should see that the larger trials and the smaller trials have roughly the same effect size. So above and below the line is going to be symmetric, an equal number of big trials that are a little bit more positive and equal to those that are a little less positive. And this is a very nice symmetric plot. You can do the same thing for trials of blood pressure. And unfortunately, you don't see this nice symmetric plot. What you see is in fact that there are a lot more trials, especially the small trials, that show this great effect on lowering blood pressure, but it's not symmetric. Above the line, you see that there's no such trials. If you look to the right-hand side at the biggest trials, you see that there's barely any effect at all on blood pressure, but when you look at the very small trials, which are much less reliable, you see amazing effects on lowering the blood pressure. So when you look at this analysis, what you conclude is that there is clear evidence of publication bias. Those small trials that didn't show any effect of blood pressure lowering didn't get published. And those trials that did show an effect on blood pressure lowering did get published. 
And what that does is it causes the systemic bias and causes you to think that there's truly an effect when there actually isn't. And that's a real concern. So let's go back to the intersalt study. And this was really what put salt restriction on the map. And it was a huge study uh, done in 1988 which measured the salt consumption and blood pressure in 52 groups over 32 countries. And they collected the urine to get a sense of how much salt these people were eating, and they compared it to the blood pressure. And when they took this analysis, what they found was that there was a steady rise in the blood pressure depending on how much salt you took. And I depicted that in the blue line. However, when you look at this population of people, it's quite striking that there's four groups of people that eat very, very little salt. And these populations were quite different from the rest of the populations. So most countries in the world were eating about 150 millimoles per day, roughly. But the four outliers which were the Yanomano and Xingyu Indians of Brazil and the rural populations of Kenya and Papua New Guinea ate very little, less than 50 millimoles or less than a third of what the others were taking. And in fact, in some cases, it was like zero to two millimoles. That is 75 times less salt than the other people were taking. But not only that, but because these populations live such a different lifestyle. It wasn't simply the salt intake that was quite different. These people were uh, hunter-gatherers. They were no modern technology. So it was very, very, very different population. So whether it's fair to compare somebody who's living in the wilds of uh, the Amazon forest compared to somebody who's living in the urban forest of New York, it's, it's probably not a good comparison. And when they reanalyzed re the data in 2015, what they found is that if you took out those four populations, because they were not really representative of people in the modern world, that in fact, the, it completely changes the dynamic. In fact, as you eat more salt, your blood pressure goes down. It doesn't go up. Salt is only one part of the overall diet. You have to remember that ultra-processed foods not only contain more salt, but contain all kinds of other things, preservatives and nitrites and sugar. So maybe the salt is only a marker for eating all this highly processed food and is not actually dangerous for itself. So we can look at other countries, for example, uh, if we look at a uh, comparison of how much salt certain countries take, well, what you can see is that the countries that eat the most salt in the world by far is actually Japan. With all its soy sauce and because it lives uh, uh, on the sea, there's plenty of salt around. Denmark, Sweden, and Norway also tend to eat a lot of salt. So if the salt were responsible for this high blood pressure, well, you should really see that the Japanese people have a lot of high blood pressure. So compared to the United States, you can see in the blue bars, Japan versus the red bars, which is the United States, you can see that there's actually far, far, far less hypertension in Japan. So if you're worried about eating salt, you have, to, you have to know that the Institute of Medicine actually does not recommend that you eat a low salt diet, despite the supposed effects on its blood pressure. The other thing which we're going to discuss in our next video is, does it have actually harmful effects? Because that's what the Institute of Medicine wrote about. They were actually concerned about the harms of eating too little salt. Thanks for watching everybody. I hope you learned something. And if you did, maybe you can share it with a friend. If you want to learn more about fasting and weight loss, you can check out this other video. Have a great week everybody.